listening to mom concerned about their dying daughter and no one's rescuing her. You know, I want that nurse. Um, but does he have enough, you know, talk to the hand, burnt out nurses out there that are not listening to you. So it's a choice that you have. Are you gonna be the good nurse? Or are you gonna be that dirty, nasty, crusty nurse? Right. So, you know, um, we know that we don't wanna give something that's gonna make the delirium worse. We don't wanna be part of the problem. We wanna be part of the solution. So now, E, we look at the environment. Let's mobilize this person. Yes, they're, they're making me nervous and they're picking at things, but if I sit them on the side of the bed and say, hey, come help me with this guy, I wanna get him up in that chair. All right, so look at me and you see, can, can you do, just do some simple things. Like if he's sitting down on the side of the bed, say, push against my hand with your shin, push, push. Lift your leg up and push against me. Push, push, okay, now do it over here. Push, push, push again. Push, push. Okay. If you can do that, then I know that you can stand on your legs and pivot with one of us on each side of you. But, so that's a great, great little assessment. Your mission is to be the good nurse and try to mobilize this patient. Not be the bad nurse and put him to sleep with the benzos so he doesn't hug you. You know? So are you going to be the good nurse or are you going to be the bad nurse? Um, so then we implement the ABCDEF on the list. Right, so, um, and, and you may see it written A to N. And, um, and you may have seen this before or not, but we're just gonna review because this is what we're gonna do every day in our ICU. I did we that are ICU, ICU. Okay. They got it for me for my for ICU reg, just FYI. They got it in not to JH1. Okay, so we'll review the ABCDES A, we are going to prevent and manage their pain, right? We're gonna use a pain scale. Um, and we're probably gonna do a pain assessment at least every four hours. And then we're gonna be, we're going to see, can you wake up and breathe? All right, so with, to wake up and breathe, this patient that's in septic shock and hard, they're, they're like, they're on, they're on fentanyl, they're on propofol, um, what else are they on, you know? So what, they're, they're on these, these sedatives um, and pain, man, analgesic, that they can't breathe really deep and they can't wake up while, while we have those running. So we're gonna have to turn those off and see if they can wake up. And then if they wake up, then we're gonna say, oh good, now you're awake, I need you to breathe. And so then we'll flip the switch from assist control on the vent to spontaneous. Hey, wake up and breathe. That's what you're doing right now. That's our mission. Can you wake up and breathe? And we're determining, can they be excavated? Are they doing well? You know, are they not doing well? Are, is their blood pressure going down? Their heart rate going up? They're breathing 45 breaths a minute. They failed. So we're gonna put them back on the bed, right? But every day we have to do this, this wake up, can you be? Wake up and breathe, right? And then we need to make sure that they're getting a, a good choice of analgesia or sedation. We love um, um, dexamethasone. Um, Presidex, you've yeah. probably seen that in the you unit. I love it. it. It's, 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 uh, sure. it's associated with low delirium. Propofol too, we're seeing propofol is, is pretty good too. Um, but like again, what are we gonna avoid? Benzo. Benzo night on the pain. So if you see that on test question, just say no, oh, right? Because it causes delirium. All right, and then we're gonna do a delirium assessment every day in the unit. I got a link to that, which um, I do wanna show. Um, but it's a, a basically, it's a, um, a physician. Remind me to, to do this at the end if I have time, if I have run out of time. But the delirium assessment is every day, you got a big double page spread or single page spread in your Pearson book on the CAM ICU. That's the most common, most, um, most used assessment tool every shift in ICU that we have to do on our patients. And we need to look and see, are they delirious or not? And, and we need to fill out that assessment. Um, and, then, and then try to do mitigating factors to decrease the delirium. And again, E, early mobilization. How many times can I stay, put them on the side of the bed, try to get them up in that chair? And then F, involve the family. If you get them up in the chair, tell the family, you have to sit right here next to him in this chair and you cannot leave. If you're gonna leave, you need to call me and I'll come sit next to him. But we can't have them, <coughs> the delirious patient being confused and get up out of the chair and fall into the bed. All right, so, so what are the dens I've had? 
than the guy asking that. So bam, you zan, you con, and you liver, and you don't give them their delirium causes. So remember, use those non-pharmacological interventions. Look for their glasses, look for their hearing aids. Um, shut the doors, make the environment quiet. Make it, all your friends out there laughing out in the hallway, be quiet. Um, <clears throat> let them sleep. Uh, you, you can dim, the, we, we have the, these red lights in our unit, so we can go to patient's room, turn on the red lights, make just take, keep sleeping, and we can go do our assessment. Our, our, we pull out like a little pin light, you know, and do our assessments without waking them up. But what does lab do when lab, at, at four o'clock in the morning? Because I know they did it to me when I was like, we'll spend the night with my dad. What does lab do at four o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. Turn the light. Hey, come here, labs. I mean, is this a shocking way, inhumane way, to be treated at four o'clock in the morning? The first thing I did was like, turn that light off. What are you doing? Why are you behaving this way? You know, turn on the red light. Oh my God. You know, we really need to check ourselves how we behave and how we're treating people um, because we're. There's a lot of us that are treating people poorly and humanely. Um, we're going to do early mobilization. Every day you're going to have your manager come down the room. Can that catheter come out? Can that central line come out? Every day we're looking to see things that cause infection. Can it come out? Or is it because we don't put in dwelling urinary catheters in patients to make your day pleasurable. All right? We only do it if we're, if, the, if we need it for hourly, you know, we're doing bullet. You know, we're checking to see our boluses and we have to do hourly INOs. But as soon as like the patient wakes up and they can urinate and they can get on bed like get that catheter out, right? It's just going to infect them. Uh, corrective dehydration, corrective pain management, um, minimize the noise, avoid those restraints, avoid malnutrition and dehydration. Okay. So um, these are the things that you're going to do to reduce, reduce the delirium. If you reduce the delirium, you're going to reduce the PTSD. So be quiet, or too noisy. World Health says the unit should be less than 35 decibels, but 70 to 90 percent of the time our ICUs are way beyond that. Um, and we are not letting our patients sleep, and so now they're sleep derived, and then they develop PTSD, and who wakes them up? The healthcare team, we do. So we need to change our ways, close the doors, make the room soundproof. Think about what we're doing. Think about caring for that patient like it's your mother or you know somebody that you love. You know, and that will that will change your ways. You know, but you just got to think of patients. You know, they're loved by somebody. You know, we need to honor that and avoid the things that cause blur. So somebody texted me and she goes, Oh well, your test questions that you can pass are not application level. I, I want to point out that this is an application level question. This is, so if I give you this question, the nurse has to, to plan care for a patient in ICU with sepsis to prevent post-ICU syndrome, right? What should the nurse do? <clears throat> Select all the five. So I'm going to give you a list of things to do, but I'm going to even make it harder. It's going to be now fill in the blank. What would they do? So I need y'all answer. What will we do to prevent that Post ICU delirium syndrome. Close the door. Close the door. Close the door. Sound off. Get off. Get the restraints off of them. Mobilize them. Get the catheter out. Right. And what else? No benzos. No benzos. Right. Good. Awesome. So that is a select all that apply. You know. So you just did that from memory. Now remember, sepsis is a mess. Remember, everything's coming to try to kill the bacteria. We got platelets coming. We got neutrophils. We got, um, and they're they're spraying like um, antihistamines, and we call this a cytokine storm. And it can lead to shock and mods, and it can also lead to DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. So, as sepsis goes downhill, from sepsis to septic shock, then it can go down to, and we think sepsis is what? What's our problem with sepsis? Hypoperfusion of all of our organs, right? 
So if we have two or more organs hypoperfused, we call that multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Two or more organs. So if they're confused, that's one organ. If they're on the ventilator, that's another organ, right? So that's mine. So what can happen is as they cascade down, they can develop this disseminated intravascular coagulation. Where we where use our clotting factors up and now we start bleeding. So their IV catheters, they're bleeding there. The gums are bleeding. They're bleeding around their NG2. Um, and we see when we look at their, their labs, we see their platelets are low. Their PTT is prolonged. It's taken them a long time to clot because they've used up their clotting factors. Um, uh, we'll see low fibrinogen. Um, we'll see elevated fibrin split products. It may also be called fibrin degradation products from your lab. Um, you may see blood into the urine. And D-dimer, that's like your classic lab that's going to be elevated if you have a clot. Now, you can have a clot in your leg and have an elevated D-dimer. But you can also have a million microclots everywhere and have an elevated D-dimer in DIC. So D-dimer, an elevated D-dimer just means you got a clot somewhere, or multiple clots. The higher the D-dimer, the higher the number of clots, or the bigger the clot. All right, so what do we treat this? Well, if they're bleeding, we'll give them red blood cells. If their fibrinogen levels are low, we're gonna give them cryoprecipitate. If um, that's like, you know, they have that long PPT, we're gonna give cryoprecipitate, and then platelets with the low platelet levels. And, um, oh, excuse me, and fresh frozen plasma, sorry, for the long PPT. Cryoprecipitate for the low fibrinogen. It's also lower the, the PPT for long rate. So those are the blood products that you would give for if you develop DIC. And we said multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, two or more uh, organs. And then um, in the last minutes, I've got a care plan over there that we're gonna implement for, for Aaron, but not just Aaron, anybody that, that comes into our ED with a septic shock. Um, remember from Fusion 3, we use chemodynamics. We learned chemodynamics, we can apply them here too. So if, the, so if their fluid, if their vessels are leaking, what do we think their central venous pressure will be, high or low? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Low, because the, the, the venous return to the right side of our heart is low because we're leaking, right? Mm -hmm. And then pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, that, that's gonna tell us like that left ventricle, how full is that left ventricle? So what if, do we think our left ventricle is gonna be real full of fluid? Mm -hmm. No, so our pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is gonna be low. Um, systemic vascular re uh, uh, resistance, I think about the um, aorta. So is my, or may my aorta dilated or is it constricted? Mm -hmm. This way? Ooh, dilated. Dilated. So in septic shock, is my, is my aorta dilated? Are my vessels dilated or are they constricted? They're dilated, they're dilated right? So what will my SVR be? Systemic vascular resistance. Is there a lot of resistance in the dilated error? So my systemic vascular resistance is going to be way low, right? Anybody that's in shock, their SVR is way low. All right, so we're just using what we learned for fusion three for this patient. Are we good on this? All right, so um, our blood pressure is going to be low. Our urine output is going to be low. Our heart rate is going to compensate for the low blood pressure, so it's going to be fast, right? Um, PF ratio, we said it's going to start with leaking in the lungs, we're going to see it below. You know, we're going to see them warm at first. Why are they warm? Because they go They've been dilated, right? So then we're going to, so our afterload, we said our afterload is high or low? Is our afterload, our SBR, is our SBR low. high or low? Low. What does SBR represent? Below the afterload or contractility? Our afterload is low, our SVR is low, right? Our aorta is dilated, right? So in that situation, we're looking to see, you know, after we give the bolus, what drugs are we gonna hang? Those drugs that vasoconstrict, or vasopressors, vasoconstrictors, same thing, that's norepinephrine, epinephrine, um, dopamine, neosinephrine, right? Uh, Lactate, how bad is the perfusion? Well, how, how high is the lactate? The worse the shock, the higher the lactate. 
All right. And we are worried if the lactate is less than two, excuse me, greater than two, we are going to bolus them and treat them like septic shock if their lactate is four or greater. Remember, get the two septic cultures and prevent infection. So you as a nurse have to decide that you're going to be that good nurse and not that crusty nurse, and we are not going to infect a patient. So every time we give IV push through a central line, we're going to scrub the hub, including the neck of the hub and the top of it, and we're going to sing happy birthday while we scrub it because we need time and pressure you know, to scrub that hub to get rid of the germs that are sitting there. You don't want to shove those germs into the patient's um, single line. You're going to cause that's it. So um, that's what a requirement. Do a few soaps every shift. Say the word sepsis when you're worried about stuff. Is it possible to have zero central line infections? Yes, it is. Hospitals do it every day. How's your hospital doing? How many central line infections has your hospital had in the last last year? It takes a village. So unless all of the nurses in our hospital agree we're not going to infect the central line, all it takes is one person to become infected. And, and then that one person is going to go home, take the kids to Little League, and go on with their life while this patient slowly cascades from that infection down to septic shock and fight for their life. So it's very important for the culture of your hospital to be, we are not dirty, crusty nurses here. We scrub our hubs and we do the bundles of care to prevent <coughs> central line infections. 68,000 people died in one year from central line associated bloodstream infections. Clavsy. Have we learned about clavsy in any of our classes? Central line associated bloodstream infections. When, when y'all got checked off on your central lines, did y'all talk about central line bloodstream infections? They call that clavsy. So y'all need to graduate from here knowing what clavsy is. There's bundles of cares that we prevent central line associated bloodstream infections. And unless all of us follow those rules, that patient's central line is going to get infected. And then they're going to get septic and go to septic shock and go to mods and go to DIC and they're going to die. So we have to do things that prevent the infection. The, the link here is like a really sad story about a mom talking about her daughter. She has central line. She's like a toddler. She's like two years old. And um, <coughs> she ended up dying from the central line infection. And it was just so sorrowful to watch her tell the story. That's the, that's the link to the story. And it just breaks my heart that um, that we can get a slap. You know, we can decide, oh, I'm in here. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this IV push to the central line. And, oh, I forgot to get a chlorhexidine swab. Or I forgot to get an alcohol swab. Well, that's where you say, stop. I can't affect the patient. I've got to go over there, get my alcohol, bring it over here. You can't just go ahead and let yourself, give yourself permission to affect the patient. You just kind of have to take that oath that you're not going to affect the patient. And that we're not going to accept central line infections because they can be um, prevented. But we have to have a zero tolerance. So how are all these central lines getting infected? And, the, and our central line infection rates went up as a nation during the pandemic because all these patients with COVID, this is before everybody had vaccines and stuff. I mean, many of you know what I'm talking about. You would go into the unit, all the doors would be closed, all the infusion pumps were connected to their patient, the tubing was running underneath the door, and we had the pumps outside the door. And so now we have these tubes running across the floor, <laughs> going up you know, to the patient, the bedside. And of course, we were, and so we we're manipulating, we were decreasing our contact with COVID by, you know, titrating the infusion pump outside the room. But, but that's less um, assessment on that, that dressing, that central line dressing occlusive. Or, you know, when I repositioned this, did I tug on it? Did I make the central line unocclusive? And now germs are just crawling in. So, you know, of course, our, our uh, central line rates went up, infection rates went up during COVID. Um, so every time we manipulate or we, we hang a, a, a tubing into a tubing or we give an IV push through a tubing or, or we don't change that occlusive dressing that has become unocclusive, 
anytime this thing happens is we're, we're allowing infections to enter the central line. You know, if you have a, 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 a pit going through the antecubital, you know, and you don't have an inclusive dress, dressing, it just um, comes on up. Now, if, if the ED, you know, if you have a patient came in through the ED and they got this beautiful 18-gauge catheter, you know, right here in the antecubital, do you know that you're supposed to change those IVs within 24 hours? Because it was put in out in the field under poor conditions, like they may have just done like one little swipe and put the IV in. So those are supposed to be changed. Um, okay, so what was happening, what we found doing research is that 30 to 45% of our needleless ports are contaminated and biofilms develop inside the big catheter and particles from that biofilm will um, break off and go traveling through the bloodstream. So now we got infections traveling through the bloodstream. So it's very, very important that we scrub the hub and that people were put out into the, um, <coughs> into the um, and working as nurses and 31% um, of the clinicians that were assessing these, these lines didn't even try to disinfect before they gave a push through it or before they connected the tubing to it. So that's a third of us didn't and I had somebody that came in my dad's room and um, I was like, ooh, you didn't decontaminate before you pushed that. He goes, oh, these ports don't need to be decontaminated. And I'm just like, on earth, are you, are you giving me that story? Like, I was like, that's not, that's not true. You got scrub the hub and decontaminate, dude. You know, like, I, it just amazes me what people tell, you know, clueless family members, you know, and it's just very shocking when they realize I ain't clueless, you know, mm -hmm. you, better, you better change your ways. Um, <laughs> but what else? Deacon, uh, compliance at, in one study shows only 10% compliance to scrubbing the hub, singing happy birthday while you're scrubbing the hub. Um, but the good news is nurses that were trained on scrubbing the hub, um, uh, that they could improve their practice. And so one unit even instituted like buzzing systems so that they could set the timer for singing happy birthday while they're scrubbing the hub. When the timer went off, then they could stop scrubbing the hub. So, um, but we, we don't need the timer. We can just sing happy birthday while we're, we're scrubbing the hub. So that's like a first step in preventing the infection. Don't reuse a pad. If, you, if you're giving um, IV push, you know, don't throw a pad onto the bed and then pick up that dirty, filthy pad and wipe with it because it's, it's contaminated now. It's got germs on it. Now you're smearing germs everywhere. So just think about what you're doing when it comes to infection. So the Clavsy Bundle of Care, here's a link to Hopkins um, Hospital on Clavsy Bundle of Care. It's just, it's, the, the central line's gonna go in, it's gonna be put in at the bedside. Um, we're gonna get rid of all the family members in the room and we're going to, everyone that's gonna go in, is gonna wash their hands, soak in water. We're gonna put on all the garbs, that, um, our, our, we're gonna put on the bonnet, um, the, the uh, gowns, and, um, and we're gonna mask, and we're gonna mask the patient too. Um, if, the, if the line's going in, they're gonna be fully draped, so the room is gonna look like a operating room. So blue head to toe, but not just a little drape, but a full head to toe drape. Everybody's gonna be masked on it. Um, we're gonna have a timeout and then a checklist. Is this the right patient? Are we, you know, are we doing the right thing for the right patient? Do we, are we scrubbing the area of chlorhexidine, right? Because that's part of the bundles of care to prevent the infection as we're putting in the line at the bedside. And then do you have an inclusive, transparent dressing? We, we can let those stay on for seven days, but if it's been on 30 minutes and becomes unocclusive, you have to change it again. As soon as it becomes unocclusive, you have to change it. And um, every day, you should be saying, do we still need the central line? Because the longer it's in, the more opportunity for us to become infected. <laughs> the potty bundles, um, so what is that? Um, Catherine's 
TSA and urinary tract um, infection bundles. So if you have an indwelling urinary catheter, you have to, you know, if you have to put it in, you need to make sure that you're confident at putting it in. If you're not confident at putting it in, don't put it in, go to the skills lab and practice. But we need to wash our hands with soap and water. We need to put the barrier, you know, again, we're gonna set up the blue sterile areas and follow a sepsis. Um, insert it only if we're properly trained. We're always gonna keep that, that, that bag, the urinary bag of full urine, we're gonna keep that below their bladder. And I had a resident come in one time, and he picked up the, you know, and all day long, we've been like, he's now there measuring what their urine output was, right? And then dumping it into the bag, like kind of this position. And this resident comes in and he picks up the bag and he holds it up like that, <laughs> you know, to, to his eyes. So it's way above the patient's bladder, and all that urine is just running back into the patient's bladder, and that causes infection. And I was like, dude, you can't do that. You gotta put it back down. That causes infection. Back like the oh, I didn't know. I like, <laughs> you know, he was just, he was getting a young resident, and he just didn't know he did. Um, but you do have to, you know, protect your patients. Um, just say it nicely. Um, you don't want the bag to overflow. You don't want the bag to be hanging on the floor, right? The floor is filthy dirty. Um, every day we're gonna check to do daily neonatal care. And every day we're gonna say, do they need this catheter? Can it come out? So here is a test question. The nurse admits the 100 kilogram patient with sepsis and hypotension to the ED, and they're gonna implement the one hour bundle. Which intervention is implemented? A. Which one? A. A, why did you say A? 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 milliliters per kilogram. For the bolus. Okay, and that gives us 3,000 milliliters, and we convert that to liters, that's 3 liters. Yes, awesome, you applied very well. All right, let's see here. After reviewing the MAR, as the patients have been shocked, this is definitely an application level question. After reviewing the MAR, the patients have been shocked. Which medicine should we administer? So if I can only pick one, which one are we gonna pick? Hey, the norepinephrine, 0.2 mics per kilogram per minute, and titrate by 0.2 mics per kilogram per minute every five minutes to get now greater than 65. Right? Earlier you said three max minutes. Dose is three. What? Earlier you said three minutes. Every three minutes, I'm gonna say here. Oh, this one says every five minutes. Okay. Yeah, so you may it's have, okay. it, it could be different, it could be different. Um, I think of my units every three units, but I think that's what it is, I'm gonna pull up, every five minutes, so I'm, you know, I don't know what they're doing in EJ, but in small increments of time. So just look at your orders and follow the orders, right? And we've got a max dose. We're not gonna go above three mics per kilogram per minute. If we go up and up and up and we max off at three, we can't go up, right? So but the blood pressure's still low, what are we gonna do? Um, we, no we need some orders for what? Vasopressin. Or it could be that this norepinephrine is just not gonna work. And we may see, like, replace the norepinephrine with um, epinephrine. You know, epinephrine But we need some words because they're not responding if we're at our max dose. All right, what if this was a select all that apply? After review of the MARA, the patient's septic shock, what medications could we give? Select all that apply. Could we give norepinephrine? Yes. 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 Check. Could we possibly give LASIK? They're in septic shock. Not really, but if they have like some over yeah. overload yeah. and the bowl is too much, you could. But this is, the orders here is give 10 milligrams an hour and titrate by one milligram every hour to keep the urine output up to 0 0.5 kilograms per hour. So no. Are we gonna put them on a, on a continuous no. LASIK? No. Uh-uh. No, they're in shock, right? So we're not gonna do that. Dobutamine, could we possibly yes. give yes. dobutamine? Yes. That's the inotrope? Yes. Yep. That might help get that blood pressure up. You know, if we go up and up on the norepinephrine, it could be we say, well, maybe they're having like a little, they, they need some more contractility. Let's hang dobutamine and see how they do. You know, stay at your max dose of your norepinephrine, but now let's hang the dobutamine and see if we see improvement. All right, so yes, we would check dobutamine. Yes, we could possibly use it. Milrinone, could we possibly use it? Yes. Yeah, it says, uh, Followed by, for continuous infusion, if the dobutamine is at the max dose, mm -hmm. right? So we could we could use that. What about the nitroprusside? No, 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 why no? It's it's a a <laughs> it will cause vasodilation, and he's already vasodilated. He's already, it's gonna make it worse. The shock is gonna be worse, right? So y'all, you are applying what you know in these test questions. 
Um, if you're looking at their hemodynamics and you see we started them on the norepinephrine drip and now we see these, these numbers, cardiac output is four, is that good or bad? No. It's low normal. And we know in sepsis that afterload is so low that a heart can just go eh. And, and so our numbers, our cardiac output numbers can be normal, especially at the beginning. All right, so all right, cardiac output's not really bugging me. It is low normal, but I suspect that in sepsis, right? So now we see my math. Let's learn how we feel about the math. We are all freaking out about that math of 45. It is bad, right? And the SVR, what are we thinking? Low. 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 My afterload is low, low right? I'm in shock when I look at those numbers, right? And my pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is Low. Low, right? So this looks like the septic shock hemodynamic. So what am I going to do? We're on the left bed, on the norepinephrine strip. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And increase the rate. Increase the rate. Yes, because look at your map. It's so low. We're going to go up. So see, you're applying what you know um, in these test questions. You, you got a patient with septic shock and you got an 18 gauge IV, purple IV. Um, and they said, uh, Paying norepinephrine. So you're going to say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to clarify with the healthcare provider, or I'm going to call for a central line before I start hanging this norepinephrine, or I'm going to begin the infusion through the purple IV, or I never infuse norepinephrine through a purple IV. Which one? Begin. Begin. B. We're, we're going to begin the infusion through the purple IV, but then we're going to do what? Call. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So I want to go to this really quick. I'm going to. Close this down, just some off. And I want to just do a plan of care, and I'm, um, we've got 10 minutes to do it. So um, I'm going to let you know, write, I'm going to write the board. Okay. You, want, you want me to write while they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is our diagnosis for Aaron or people like Aaron who present to us in septic shock? Decreased perfusion. Anybody in shock, your number one problem is decreased perfusion. So we have a decreased perfusion. Why do we have that decreased perfusion? It's related to what? We got what? We got microclots related to microclots. And leaky vessels and and what? And vasodilation. Those three things are going on in sepsis, and that's causing hypoperfusion, decreased perfusion. And why? What's the culprit? Secondary to septic shock. That infection has caused us to cascade into septic shock, right? So it's going to be all those things are happening because we're in septic shock. Secondary to septic shock. <laughs> History. What in Erin's history was significant? Recent surgery. Should we what? Recent surgery. All right. Recent surgery. History. That that's a red flag. What else is a red flag? Neighbors mm -hmm. came in catheter, right? So we're gonna we're gonna add that into like so we'll say history of decreased urine output, right? Mm -hmm. And stinky urine, right? What else in history of? She had, she had surgery. What about somebody else that develops septic shock? Anybody else? Who else develops septic shock? Elderly. Who? Elderly. Elderly. All right, the very old. Or? The very, very young. You know, for high risk. All right. What else? So, didn't you tell me that somebody had sepsis had a, um, a flesh eating yeah. How did he get the ne ne sis? From what? A cyst. So we have a, a cyst that, that, that wasn't there, a cyst formation that wasn't there before? All right, what other kind of histories do we have? Mm -hmm. Immunocompromised patients? What other in the history? Oh, when they go home, like with the central line, like for antibiotics. All right, but now they come into our ED and they got, they, they're not looking good and they got an indwelling central line. They got an invasive line in them. Yes, that's a big red flag, right? Or an indwelling catheter, right? All right. All of those things in that, are, that history are red flags to us. 
Is there anything else that y'all can think of? Seeing somebody and stuff? Maybe what? History of? Sorry? Who's more prone to get infections? Mm -hmm. uh, is so what? Mm -hmm. I need your ears to hear what this is. Lung condition? Okay, a lung, some of a lung condition. Right, so some have asthma, COPD, have this chronic infection. What other chronic kind of problems? Diabetes. Diabetes. And then what did y'all learn that also? Who, who, who was that? Renal. Renal, yeah, those renal patients that are on dialysis, right? All of those are big red flags in their history. All right, defining characteristics. What defining characteristics? What symptoms do we see when they, the patient comes into our ED or we go up into their room and, and have to call a rapid response. What do we see? Increased respiration. Increased respiration is greater than? 20. 20. Okay. Decreased systolic, less than 100. Decreased systolic, less than 100. Low urinary output. Increased white blood cell, but you're not going to see that until you do the lab. Increased white Okay, but when we get the capillary refill. It's going to be, capillary refill is going to be? Three, three, four. Prolonged, mm -hmm. right? The model scale. Model, modeling. Remember that there was a young redhead boy named Rory that was sent home. The family didn't know that modeling was a size mm -hmm. that we were going into mod. Right? Hyper or hypothermic? Was that hyper or hypothermic? Mm -hmm. Yes, spike fever or oh, we are oh, we're oh, immunocompromised oh, and our temperature is way down here. So systolic, you know, you're just thinking systolic, I don't want it above. 38 and I don't want to less than 36. 36. Um, what else? Any other signs or symptoms? Blood coma score. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so confusion, lethargy, uh, thrashing, you know. Um, what else? Decreased urine output. Okay, decreased urine, right? We want the urine to be less than 0 0.5 mils per kilogram. Anything else? SIRS criteria? Is the respiratory rate over? Yeah, we got a fast respiratory rate. SIRS. All right, if we do some labs, what would our WBCs be? Elevated. Mm -hmm. Right, they're, they're going to be elevated. We're going to have glucose psychosis. Possible um, elevated lactate. Lactate. Um, greater than two, 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 two. Yeah, greater than two, we're concerned, right? Okay. The worse the perfusion, the higher the lactate is going to be, right? At this stage, you're doing the procalcitonin anyway, or you just procalcitonin. So that's going to be helpful. So if we have a bacterial infection, procalcitonin will be high, right? So all right, good. So what labs do we want to draw? Blood culture, ABGs, blood cultures, two sets, aortic aortic. Two different sites. You can do the ABGs, Billy Rubin, WBCs, yeah. Billy Rubin, Billy Rubin, and Triadme. In and out cath. And what? In and out cath. If For our labs. Yeah, well, you want a steroid. Oh, so under treatment. So we may, we, so we're uh, going to hold off on that. Um, but right now we're, we're talking about what labs are we gonna what are we gonna draw? Are, are, so you're talking about a urine? urine yeah. Okay, so, so we can do a urine. If, so source control, we want to do a urine culture if we're thinking that, you know, it's from the, the, the urinary tract, right? If if it, if they're popping up green, we would collect a urine specimen. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go down to treatments. Treatments and diagnostic tests. So if they're coughing up green, we would expect a chest x-ray. If the urine smells bad, a culture Okay, and we might do a KEB, right? Um, source control. If we think it's a cyst in the abdomen, or you know, they had surgery in the abdomen, we may do CT. Right, we may do an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Awesome. If um, and then if they they're not if they're having a hard time oxygenating, what might they need? If they can't oxygenate, we put on nasal cannula. Now we got we go up. And now we need a We need some live ones. Well, and then we may have if they can't oxygenate, we may have to intubate them. Right? So under treatments, if they may need it, they may need to vent. 
support them on the ventilator until we get through the sepsis cascade. Uh, because when blood pressure starts going down, they go down very fast. Intervention. So if we have to intubate them, what interventions? Um, the VAP protocol. The VAP protocol. That means, what does that mean? PPI. The OCD is lobotized and the chlorhexidine in the mouth. Yeah. It's a daily day. They're going to come off the bed. <laughs> you just hear Wendy Garrett and yeah, you hear that protocol. Head, that's just she what I said. Is. Today's the day we're going to turn off some sedation. You're going to come off this thing. Probably not. Every day we need to what? Every day, what do we need to do if they're an event? A, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, E, F. A to F bundles, right? Right? Wake up and breathe, right? We're looking to see can you wake up and breathe? Are we mobilizing you? Are we getting the family involved? Is the ABCD? Do we want to prevent delirium in our sepsis patients? No bendos. All right, so what are we going to do? No bendos. And then just say no. All right, and then, um, and then what else? Delirium. What else? What other things will we do? Keep it quiet. 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 Keep it let them sleep. Let them sleep. Mm -hmm. I, 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 what about the day daylight stuff? What would we do? Open, open, the, 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 day, open the shades during the day, oh, close them at night, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. all these humane things that we, we need to do. Do we want to, do we want to keep them tied up? No. no. We want to get, we'll try to get those stressed out. So we want to try to do anti-delirium measures. Um, yeah, we want to mobilize them. ABCDF. Um, what would we teach? She's my daughter. I come to visit her. What are you going to teach me? About the washroom. Okay. Do you tell, if you see somebody come in this room, you tell them to wash their hands. You have that power. Mom, you tell anybody to come in this room to wash their hands. And then you wash your hands. Right? That's a good thing. But we're also going to teach them about everything that's going on in this room. You know, like, oh, this is, that's an art line. You know, we're, we're going to try to just orient them. We're going to give them updates. Hey, the antibiotics look like they're working. The WBCs are coming down. 
So we're gonna have those kind of discussions with the family members. You know, yay, that, that's looking good. Mm -hmm. Or the fingers are starting to turn black, I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. You know, and then we might start talking about, you know, um, how the shunting takes place. And we're gonna try to be very stingy with our, our North and Right? Outcomes, what's our problem? Hypo for, uh, so confusion will improve as evidenced by Oh, okay. Last count of 50. Okay. Uh, 400. Math? Greater than 150,000. No. Platelets? Yeah. I mean, greater than 